For the past four months, my wife had been engrossed in her special project. While it wasn't solely her endeavor, she held the lead role and bore the weight of its success. This project was pivotal for Bixler Enterprises, the company she worked for, yet its specifics remained a mystery to me. The relentless hours she dedicated to it made these past months challenging. Its success wasn't just important to her, it was crucial for the survival of Bixler Enterprises. Karen, with her bachelor's degree from Albright and an MBA from Morton, was unquestionably the brains of our family. In contrast, I had entered the workforce straight out of high school, carving out a career as an auto body technician for over two decades. Despite the simplicity of my job title, I found satisfaction in the work and its accompanying paycheck. It had provided enough to put Karen through college and raise our two children comfortably. While we didn't lead a life of luxury, we managed just fine. Now that our children were grown and flown, our dual incomes ensured a comfortable standard of living for us both. Within just three months of our marriage at the tender age of 18, Karen became pregnant. Those initial years of our union saw us residing with my parents in their spacious, empty house as my siblings had all flown the nest. This arrangement proved invaluable, providing us with built-in childcare while Karen juggled the demands of early college years alongside motherhood. The journey towards her four-year degree stretched into six due to the interruptions of pregnancies, presenting its share of challenges. Yet, Karen persevered. Throughout this time, I remained steadfastly employed, never lacking for work or overtime opportunities when needed. Upon Karen's completion of her studies at Wharton, we finally ventured into our own rented abode. Although she received enticing job offers from prominent firms, they all entailed relocation, a prospect Karen wasn't keen on. Instead, she opted for a position at Bixler Enterprises, a decision driven by her desire to remain close to home. Despite the tempting salary offered by Bixler, what truly mattered to Karen was the sense of responsibility and prospects for advancement the company provided. Her dedication and diligence as an employee were unquestionable, setting her on a trajectory toward success within the company. The presentation was scheduled for Thursday at the Radisson Hotel in Philadelphia. I had taken a few days off in case Karen needed my assistance, but it turned out my contribution mainly amounted to preparing meals for her upon her return. Admittedly, I had little interest in her work, finding high-level corporate affairs rather dull. Business executives from across the globe, Europe, Asia, and South America, were flying in for the event. The company spared no expense, covering their airfares and accommodation at the Radisson. From Karen's remarks, it was evident that the company was stretching its finances thin. Her presentation held immense significance not only for her, but also for the company and its extensive workforce. Initially, everything appeared to be proceeding smoothly until Tuesday evening. Karen arrived home with a new ensemble, a commanding gray power suit paired with a crisp white blouse. With meticulous precision, she laid out all the essentials for her trip on the guest room bed. While her approach to housekeeping was typical, her attention to detail in her professional matters was unparalleled. I couldn't fathom why she felt the need to pack her fancier undergarments, but I opted not to question her. Alongside her presentation attire, she had selected a few elegant cocktail dresses for the pre- and post-event social gatherings. While I typically avoided such functions, I offered to accompany her out of obligation. However, she politely declined, assuring me it wasn't necessary. All the materials and equipment necessary for her presentation had been meticulously packed in the trunk of Karen's Volvo before she left work. She preferred to handle the transportation herself to ensure everything arrived in perfect condition. With Wednesday dedicated to preparations and the ensuing evening reserved for socializing with guests, Karen was fully immersed in her tasks. Recognizing her expertise and precision in such matters, I felt it best to simply stay out of her way. As the evening drew to a close, Karen had meticulously checked and rechecked every detail. All that remained for her was a relaxing shower and a restful night's sleep. However, my well-intentioned attempt to assist backfired when I stumbled upon a small white envelope that slipped out of the side pocket of her makeup case while rearranging items on the bed. The envelope bore the insignia of a pharmacy unfamiliar to us, containing 10 pills labeled Praven. 
Perplexed by its purpose, I scrutinized the vague instructions. Take one pill as necessary, and take a second pill 12 hours later. The prescription, in Karen's name, had been filled just days prior on Monday. Suppressing the urge to confront her immediately, I resolved to investigate further before broaching the topic, mindful of the implications of invading her privacy. It was a dilemma I loathed. As Karen prepared for bed, I turned to our home computer and swiftly searched for information on Preven. Ten minutes later, I joined my wife under the covers, but sleep eluded me as I pondered the puzzling discovery of her prescription for the morning after pill. This revelation seemed particularly perplexing given my vasectomy a decade prior. The following morning found me awake but unrested, prompting a solitary walk in hopes of finding clarity. Despite my efforts to quell my unease, anxiety gnawed at me as I made my way back home. With both our children, Charlie and Irene, pursuing their own paths, Karen and I were now alone together. While I missed our children dearly, I cherished the prospect of growing old alongside Karen, the only woman who had ever held my interest. However, the unsettling discovery threatened to cast a shadow over our relationship. Despite my trust in Karen and my reluctance to pry into her affairs, doubts and suspicions crept in. If there were any secrets, Karen was adept at concealing them. Yet I never felt compelled to scrutinize her emails or phone calls as my faith in her remained steadfast. It was a disconcerting realization, one that left me grappling with uncertainty about the future of our marriage. Jerry, where were you? Do you want eggs or something? Karen's voice sliced through the morning air. No, just coffee, I replied tersely, lacking the desire for conversation. What's wrong, honey? It's only for three days. You can come along if you want, but you'll be bored to tears. I don't really want to go, I admitted, but I hate leaving you alone. I worry when you're gone. That's sweet, dear, but everything will be fine, Karen reassured me. I don't plan on leaving the hotel the whole time. Today, I'll be setting up the conference room and later, charming our potential customers. Tomorrow, I'll barely have time to pee. I'll be back early on Friday, and I promise you a fantastic weekend if you catch my drift. Sounds good, I acknowledged, but you can't blame me for worrying. I'm just an auto body man, and I have a beautiful, successful wife. Sometimes I wonder if you're as focused on advancing our marriage as you are on advancing your career. Stop that, Jerry, Karen snapped. I've always respected what you do, and I've never indicated otherwise. You've raised two amazing kids and put me through college. You're a wonderful husband, a great father, and a reliable provider. Don't you ever forget that. I finished my coffee as Karen cleared the table. Do you want me to call you? I inquired. No, that's not a good idea, she replied. I'll have my cell phone off, and I'll be turning off the room phone at night to get some sleep. I'll call you whenever I can. I assisted her in loading the car, noting her meticulousness extended to every aspect of her work-related tasks. It would take her about three hours to reach the Radisson, but at least she would avoid the morning traffic on the Schoolkill Expressway. As she drove off, I couldn't bring myself to broach the topic of the pills. I spent the remainder of the morning on the porch, consumed by an overwhelming sense of worry unlike anything I had ever experienced. I felt small and inadequate, out of place in the world of high-stakes corporate dealings my wife navigated effortlessly. The contrast between my modest background, mundane job, and Karen's success seemed glaringly obvious now, leaving me feeling foolish. My best attire consisted of a blue blazer and a pair of slacks, with ties that were a decade out of style. Just as I finished dressing, the landline phone rang. Hi, honey. I wanted to let you know I arrived safely, Karen's voice reassured me. You made good time. I'm guessing the traffic wasn't too bad, I replied. Everything was smooth. I'll call you later tonight. They're unloading the car for me now. I'm in room 714. Karen, I might not be here tonight. I might be at my parents' or my brother's. If you call, use my cell phone, I informed her. Okay. Love you. Gotta go, she said before hanging up. I took my time driving into Philadelphia, not heading straight to the Radisson. Instead, I made a pit stop for a cheese steak. With a long night ahead of me, 
I found myself uncertain about my next move as I parked in the hotel garage. I sat and waited, contemplating when to enter the hotel. Eventually, a call on my cell phone nudged me towards a decision. Jerry, just wanted to update you, I'm all settled in. Heading downstairs to mingle and grab some dinner, Karen's voice came through. Did you forget anything? I asked, unable to shake off my worries. Nope, everything's set. I've got everything laid out for tomorrow, she reassured me. Need anything? I inquired, wanting to be of assistance. No, Jerry, relax. I'm switching off my phone. I'll catch up with you tomorrow morning, she replied. All right, have a good time, I said, trying to lighten the mood. It's not fun, Jerry. It's work, Karen reminded me before hanging up. Amidst the bustling activity of the lobby, restaurant, and conference rooms, I managed to blend in effortlessly. The hotel provided a handy pamphlet detailing its layout, allowing me to navigate discreetly through various rooms, observing the crowds from the sidelines. The thought of Karen spotting me sent a wave of uncertainty through me, but I resolved to deal with that if and when it occurred. Consulting an events board, I noted the absence of any reservations by Bixler Enterprises for Wednesday night, a detail that caught my attention, considering Karen's assurance of staying within the hotel premises. Exploring the hotel's dining options, I began with the casual dining room, swiftly confirming Karen's absence within five minutes. My luck improved as I ventured into the fine dining area. Nestled in a cozy corner booth, Karen exuded elegance in her black, low-cut cocktail dress adorned with pearls. Her companion, appreciating her attire, exuded familiarity that I couldn't place. Despite the private rendezvous atmosphere of their table, there were ample seats available elsewhere, allowing me to discreetly observe from a distance. Candles flickered on the tables, but I extinguished mine, feigning discomfort due to my glaucoma when questioned by the waiter. Opting for a simple chicken entree, I settled in and engaged the waiter in conversation, gesturing discreetly towards the familiar figure across the room. Excuse me, the gentleman at that table, he looks familiar. Do you know who he is? I inquired. Certainly, sir. That's Martin Henderson, a city assemblyman. They're expecting him to run for Congress in the next few years, the waiter informed me. And is the lady accompanying him his wife? She's quite striking, I asked. No, sir. That's a new face. He often reserves that table for special occasions. If you catch my drift, the waiter replied with a knowing smile. I simply nodded, requesting my check, as I pondered the implications of what I had observed. I had never seen Karen so intimately engaged with another man before. Her demeanor was almost reverential, hanging on his every word as if he were a deity. Though their interactions remained within bounds, they held an unmistakable air of intimacy, far removed from platonic or professional exchanges. As they finished their second bottle of wine, I realized the purpose behind her choice of lingerie. Seeking refuge in a secluded corner of the lobby, I waited, keeping a discreet eye on the restaurant's entrance. Ten minutes later, they emerged, Karen clinging to his arm as they made their way towards the elevator. I watched intently as the floor indicators signaled their journey. Relief washed over me when the elevator halted on the third floor, a sign she hadn't taken him to her room. However, my heart sank when it bypassed the seventh floor, indicating she had likely accompanied him to his room. Determined to confirm my suspicions, I remained in the lobby, fixated on the elevator's movements for an hour. Despite the comings and goings of guests, Karen was conspicuously absent. With a heavy heart, I retrieved my empty suitcase from the car and approached the check-in counter. Despite my status as her husband, obtaining a keycard proved to be a challenge. Eventually, after they failed to reach anyone in the room, they relented. Armed with a keycard, I made my way to room 714. Initially, I sat in darkness, grappling with the harsh reality that Karen likely wouldn't return. I meticulously packed all of Karen's clothing and personal belongings, leaving nothing behind. I double-checked the packet of Preven. Ten pills remained. On the dresser, meticulously arranged, were all the essentials for her presentation the following day. Proceeding methodically, I filled my suitcase with promotional folders, 24 specially bound, along with another 20 in standard bindings. 
Next came the digital projector, meticulously prepared by Karen, followed by her laptop. I retrieved her purse and cell phone, which she had left behind in the room. All she had with her now was a clutch bag and perhaps a tube of lipstick. After scoring the room with the same care Karen would have, I ensured nothing was overlooked. Satisfied, I left her car key and my wedding ring on the dresser, leaving the room completely empty save for those two items. Navigating the elevator to the parking garage was effortless, and 20 minutes later, I was on the expressway heading north. The clock read well past 3 in the morning. I hadn't realized so much time had passed. Approximately two hours into my journey, my cell phone rang. The caller ID displayed a Radisson phone number. Jerry, yes, where are you? I'm about 20 minutes away from home. That was all I offered. Silence hung heavy on the line. There's an old adage among salesmen, the first to speak loses. After what felt like an eternity, she finally broke the silence. Jerry, I'm sorry. There were no further questions, just a click as she hung up. I powered off my phone. It was evident she was back in her room. Later that day, she'd be expected to deliver a presentation crucial for her company's survival and her own career advancement. Later that day, I'd be history. I stashed the suitcases in the attic space of the garage. Karen never ventured up there and wouldn't think to look there for anything. At this point, though, I doubted it would make a difference. I began by gathering all of my clothing and personal belongings. Like most auto body men, I owned my own set of tools, a necessity for the job. I swung by the shop to load them into my Subaru and collect my final paycheck. With the banks now open, I wasted no time in withdrawing all the money from our accounts. There were no intricate financial maneuvers, I simply emptied them. Afterward, I stopped for lunch in Hagerstown, Maryland, mulling over my newfound financial security. Despite having enough money to sustain myself for years, I knew I'd be seeking employment again soon. Karen and I shared a mutual affinity for work, and I'd miss her deeply. To pass the time, I visited Lurie Caverns, then secured a room near Withville for the night. My next steps were uncertain. By Saturday, I found myself immersed in the tranquility of the Chattanooga Aquarium, marveling at nature in ways I never had before. It struck me as a fitting place to start anew. Before supper, I secured an annual pass to the aquarium and secured lodging, a modest mobile home in a less than desirable park. But it was furnished and affordable, suiting my needs perfectly. Come Monday morning, I'd start job hunting. A skilled body man like myself could always find work, especially if willing to work under the table. I'd maintain a low profile until it was time to renew my driver's license or car tags, addressing those issues as they arose. On Sunday afternoon, I decided to give Erin a call. Despite feeling obligated to keep her informed, I learned that Karen had already spoken with her. She didn't mince words with Irene, explained the situation plainly, she had cheated, I discovered it, left, and as a consequence, she lost her job. While I regretted her job loss, it seemed like a necessary consequence. I asked Irene to fill in Charlie about the situation next time they spoke and assured her I'd check in monthly. However, I chose not to disclose my current whereabouts. By noon the following day, I secured a job. Remarkably, it was within walking distance of the trailer park, with a Waffle House conveniently situated midway. What more could a man ask for? The details of the paperwork arrangement remained a mystery, but I was content with a straightforward offer of 20 bucks an hour, no questions asked. It was a win-win situation, and I didn't even need to touch the stash of money I had brought along. About two months later, Irene informed me that Karen had moved out of the house and was residing with her parents. Beyond that, Irene was in the dark, but she expressed relief that I was settled and doing well. Charlie reached out from San Diego to share news of his upcoming cruise, a lengthy one. As an avionics technician aboard an aircraft carrier, he attempted to explain his role, but the technical jargon sailed over my head. Technical matters were never my fort. I appreciated both children's efforts to refrain from speaking ill of their mother. Life settled into a routine thereafter. I maintained weekly conversations with Irene, while Charlie and I established a regular email exchange. Although Irene kept in touch with Karen, Karen divulged little about her whereabouts or activities. 
Surprisingly, neither Karen nor I pursued divorce proceedings. I obtained a Tennessee driver's license and registered my Subaru locally. Occasionally, I frequented a nearby bar, indulging in occasional companionship without any commitment. It was a mutually beneficial arrangement with the women I met, one at a time. Life was enjoyable, and gradually, thoughts of Karen began to fade into the background. As time passed, my Subaru began experiencing mechanical issues. Reflecting over a beer, I realized almost five years had elapsed since I left home. With over 200,000 miles on the odometer, it was no wonder the outback was starting to give me trouble. Despite the distance, I remained closely connected with both children. Irene had started a family of her own, eager for me to visit and meet her children. Meanwhile, Charlie nearly tied the knot with a thigh girl, but called off the wedding at the 11th hour. Typically, my Sundays were reserved for recuperation from the previous night's festivities. So when an insistent knocking disrupted my early Friday morning peace, I wasn't pleased. Flustered and barely clothed, I flung open the door to greet the unexpected visitors. Their arrival was met with the less than flattering sight of me in my day-old underwear, and the woman's expression mirrored my sentiment. Disdain radiated from her companion, whose formal demeanor grated on my nerves. We're looking for Jerry Butler, the man stated, his tone too polished for my liking. I don't know you, I retorted, unimpressed. I'm Stephen Russell, and this is my wife, Jody. We have an issue and hoped you could assist, he persisted. I don't do odd jobs. If it's car-related, you'll have to swing by the shop, I replied bluntly, earning puzzled stares. It's not about your work, it's more personal. Can we come in? He pressed. Reluctantly, I allowed them entry into my unkempt trailer, seldom graced by guests. I rarely bothered with tidiness, as my social engagements typically unfolded elsewhere, much to the chagrin of my occasional companions. Sure, come on in. Let me throw on some pants real quick. I left the door ajar as I headed to the bedroom, opting to don a shirt as well to showcase my hospitality. Would you like some coffee? It'll only take about 10 minutes, I offered upon returning to the living room, clearing off the cluttered sofa to make space for them to sit. The offer went unanswered. We have a four-and-a-half-year-old adopted daughter in need of a bone marrow transplant, and we were hoping you could help us. We're willing to compensate you for any inconvenience, Stephen explained, his tone grave. So, you want to buy my bone marrow? I quipped, only to realize the gravity of their situation. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Please continue. Our best chance for a match comes from an immediate family member. You're our best hope, Jody interjected, her tone sincere. Look, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but I had a vasectomy over 15 years ago. I couldn't possibly be the father, I explained, hoping to convey the truth gently. Why was your name on the birth certificate? Stephen pressed a note of desperation in his voice. I can't answer that. Perhaps you should ask her mother, I suggested, the room falling into silence. Despite feeling sympathetic, I was at a loss on how to assist them. What was the mother's name? Stephen inquired. Karen Butler. I was struck speechless, grappling with a mix of regret and sorrow. If only I hadn't taken those pills from her, perhaps these people wouldn't be facing this dilemma. The grief I thought I'd overcome came rushing back, dredging up memories of Karen's infidelity with that Philadelphia politician. I'd been gradually forgetting it all, but now it flooded back, unwelcome and painful. I understand now, and I apologize for my earlier rudeness and insensitivity. I'll do everything I can to help you. But first, why can't Karen undergo the bone marrow transplant? I inquired, attempting to gather myself. Medically, she can't, Stephen replied somberly. She's not a match, but she's the mother. She should be, I reasoned, confusion mooring my thoughts. Oh, she's a match all right, but she's too ill. The doctors won't even consider using her, Jody explained. Ill? How? I pressed for further clarification. She's dying from liver failure. The doctors have given her less than six months to live, Jody revealed, the gravity of the situation sinking in. That doesn't make sense. Karen's always been in perfect health. And besides, I don't see how a bad liver would prevent her from donating bone marrow, I remarked, 
my disbelief evident. The hospital won't accept her signature on the consent form, Stephen interjected. You mean to say she's mentally unfit as well? I questioned, stunned by this new revelation. Both Stephen and Jody looked at me in silence, their unspoken thoughts hanging heavy in the air. Sensing their discomfort, I didn't press them further. It was strange how my feelings had shifted in such a short span of time, from indifference to a sudden urge to protect and assist them. How did that happen? Could either of my children be a match? I asked, hoping for a glimmer of hope. It's possible, but we saw you as our best chance, Stephen responded hesitantly. Why not pursue the real father? I suggested, feeling a surge of frustration. We believed it was you. Karen didn't mention anyone else, Jody explained. Actually, she wasn't in a condition to explain much. Most of what we know came from the adoption agency. Feeling the need for a brief respite, I excused myself. Please, give me a moment. Leaving my guests to ponder, I busied myself making a pot of coffee, a necessary comfort in the midst of this conversation. I discreetly took a much-needed bathroom break while the coffee brewed, mindful not to further embarrass Jody. Where do you live? I inquired upon returning. West Chester, Pennsylvania, Stephen replied. I'll make you a deal. If I disclose the identity of your daughter's real father, you must promise to relentlessly pursue him until you achieve your goal, I proposed, a sense of determination in my voice. What do you mean? Stephen's voice carried a mix of confusion and anticipation. The man who fathered your daughter is a well-known politician in Pennsylvania. He'll deny everything and might even try to halt your efforts with legal maneuvers, but if you push hard enough to make him admit the child is his, you might be able to shame him into agreeing to the bone marrow transplant. Isn't that what you're after? I explained, feeling a surge of determination. Absolutely, but how do we go about all this? Jody's eyes held a glimmer of hope. I'm just an auto body man, banging on metal for a living. But your best bet would be to leverage TV, radio, and newspapers. Politicians will do anything to avoid bad press. Do you have any friends who could assist? Their faces lit up with newfound hope. We think we can do that. But who is he? Stephen inquired eagerly. Martin Henderson. He's running for the U.S. Senate, I revealed, confident in my choice. He'd do anything to avoid bad publicity, Jody interjected, her voice tinged with conviction. The coffee was ready, but Stephen and Jody were eager to return home. Before they left, I provided them with Irene and Charlie's contact information, just in case. I was certain they would lend a helping hand. I also insisted they disclose Karen's whereabouts. I'd likely be in Pensacola before they reached Westchester. I freshened up with a haircut and bought a new shirt. Despite Karen being the one who shattered my life, I still wanted to present myself well when I confronted her. Arriving at another trailer park, this time a newer double-wide, I noticed Karen's Volvo with a flat tire and a shattered windshield. The woman who opened the door wasn't Karen. She appeared weathered, possibly in her mid-forties to fifty, bearing the signs of a hard life. The absence of makeup accentuated her harsh demeanor. Well, well, if it isn't Jerry Butler. I never thought I'd see you here, she greeted, a hint of sarcasm in her voice. I couldn't resist the opportunity for a retort. You've caught me at a disadvantage. Wendy Flores, come on in, honey, care for a beer, she offered, though I declined. No, thank you. I'm here to see Karen, I stated plainly. Wendy was a commanding presence, physically and otherwise. She gestured toward the dining room buffet. There she is, Jerry. Look all you want. Her hand pointed towards the brass urn resting in the center of the otherwise bare buffet. It seemed I had arrived too late. I remained still, unable to tear my gaze away from the container before me. Can I have that beer now? I muttered, needing something to numb the shock. Karen had relocated to Pensacola after putting the baby up for adoption. Using funds from her termination package at Bixler Enterprises, she purchased the trailer. Between profit sharing, 400 and onyx, and a crude leave, she had managed to amass a considerable sum. She found work at a local garment factory in the shipping department, where she crossed paths with Wendy. Wendy became a lodger in Karen's trailer, contributing to expenses. 
However, every penny Karen earned went towards alcohol. Starting with wine and progressing to cheaper spirits, she spiraled into alcoholism. Eventually, she lost her job due to her addiction and relied on her savings thereafter. Isolated and consumed by her habit, she lived in squalor with Wendy as her only companion. It took over three years for her to succumb to her self-destructive path. To my surprise, she had left behind a will, bequeathing me the double wide and the Volvo. Wendy shared that Karen's guilt over her actions had consumed her, leading her to give up on life entirely. She hadn't taken any steps to prevent the pregnancy or consider abortion. Instead, she arranged for the adoption months before the baby's birth. Karen never returned to meaningful employment, only taking on poorly performed menial jobs. Wendy observed that Karen lacked ambition and motivation, seemingly having lost her will to live. Surprisingly, Karen often spoke of me, yet never attempted to reach out, even though Irene had provided her with my contact information. It seemed as though her brief affair had inflicted deeper wounds on her than on me. After two weeks, I sold the trailer to Wendy for a symbolic dollar and fetched a grand for the Volvo. Two days later, I found myself in Westchester, visiting my newfound allies, Stephen and Jody. Martin Henderson initially resisted their efforts, but under pressure from Stephen and Jody, he relented. He demanded DNA tests, which confirmed his paternity. To save face, he reluctantly agreed to the bone marrow transplant, which proved successful. However, his political career and marriage suffered significant blows. His plummeting popularity led to his replacement by another candidate before the election, and his wife publicly filed for divorce. Currently, Karen and I are en route to Dallas to visit Irene and my grandchildren. As for how long I'll keep Karen with me, well, I suppose until someone better comes along. Thank you for watching this video to the end. If you liked it, please like it and subscribe to the channel. See you soon.